invite at the Dean of School of Biological Sciences, University of Science Malaysia, to introduce Professor Horwitz and share the session. And good afternoon. Uh, yang berbahagia Profesor Ahmad Syukri, Yang berbahagia Profesor Asma, Mr. Uwe Morawetz, Prof. Howard Hobbit, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to, I would like permission to speak in English. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this British event. Uh, it gives me a pleasure to introduce you to our distinguished speaker for today's events, Professor Howard Hobbit, the recipients of the Nobel Prize in Medicine 2002. Professor Howard uh, Robert Hobbit is a microbiologist who shared the 2002 Nobel Prize for Medicine for discovery concerning the genetic regulation of organ development and program cell death, apo apoptosis. Professor Hobbit has used genetics, molecular biology, biochemistry, electrophysiology, laser microsurgery, and pharmacology to study how genes control the development of the nervous system and how the nervous system controls behavior. He began his prize-winning work on programmed cell death, a process that is essential for normal development in the 1970s. During the fetal development of human, Huge numbers of cells must be eliminated as body structures form. For example, program cell death scalps and the fingers and toes by removing tissues that was originally present between the digits. Likewise, it removes surplus nerve cells produced during early development of the brain. In a typical adult human, about one tri trillion new cells develop each day. A similar number must be eliminated to maintain health and to keep the body from becoming overgrown with surplus cells. Professor Hobbit research focused on determining if a specific genetic program controls cells death. His study centered on the nematode, Sinorobitis elegans, a new microscopic soil nematode that has been identified by Professor Sidney Brenner as an ideal organism on which study program cell. In 1986, Professor Hobbes reported the first two dead genes, that is SAT3 and SAT4, which participate in the cell killing process. Later, he shows that another gene, SAT9, protects against cell death by interacting with SAT3 and SAT4. Professor Hobbit also established that humans have a counterpart SAT3 gene. Scientists later found that most of the genes involved in controlling the program cell death in that worm or nematode have counterpart in human beings. Such knowledge about program cell death contributed to important advancement not only in developmental biology but also in medicine, especially concerning cancer treatment. Aside from the role of program cells that in embryonic development, misregulation of program cells that may contribute to cancer and autoimmune and neurogenerative diseases. Seeing apart, the component of the cell system for regulating program cells that can greatly further understanding of diseases as well as the ability to treat them. Uh, Professor Hobbits joined the MIT Department of Biology in 1978 and was named David Koch Professor of Biology in year 2000. He is an investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and appointed investigator at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research in 2001. He received his PhD in 1974 from Harvard University. Professor Hobbit is a member of U.S. National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of Gettner Foundation International Award, the Alfred F. Sloan Jr. Prize for General Motors Cancer Research Foundation.
Bristol Myers Squibb Awards for Distinguished Achievement in Neuroscience and the Louisa Cross Bowies Prize from Columbia University. He received MIT James R. Killen Jr. Faculty Achievement Awards for 2005 to 2006. So ladies and gentlemen, with pleasure, I welcome Professor Hobbes to deliver his speech. Thank you. Let me say thank you for those kind words of introduction and also thank you to all of my hosts here at USM. I'd also like to thank Ua Moravitz um, for inviting me to participate in this program of the International Peace Foundation and also for founding the foundation as I've learned more about this organization and its goals and efforts, I continue to be increasingly impressed with what this group has done and what it continues to hope to succeed in doing. So I am very honored to be a part of this effort. I'm also personally appreciative uh, for the opportunity to be here in Malaysia. I've never visited in Malaysia before. My wife and daughter are also here. And uh, I'm particularly excited to be in Penang because we had a young woman live with us for two years who was from Butterworth. So I feel like I know this neighborhood, but only from words and photos. And so the reality uh, today is becoming uh, very much more solid, and I appreciate that opportunity also. I have entitled my lecture today, Biomedical Science, World Health, and World Peace. I believe that biomedical science, world health, and world peace are vitally interconnected. World peace is threatened by inequalities around the world inequalities in wealth, inequalities in education, inequalities in health. More fundamentally, I think, than wealth and education are inequalities in health, because without good health, neither education nor wealth can be improved. I am reminded of a conversation I had with Daniel Fisella, who is the CEO of the international pharmaceutical giant Novartis. Dan was telling me that he had established a foundation to attempt to address some of the world's inequalities. And the first project of this foundation was building a school in Mali, in West Africa. The school was built, and there was a ceremony to dedicate the new building. And Dan went from his home in Switzerland, Mali, to join in the celebration of the dedication of this building. What he found when he got there was disheartening. It was clear to him that the school was going to have very little impact. And the reason was that the children who were to attend the school, simply put, were too ill to take advantage of the opportunities that it would offer. So Dan told me that the lesson he learned is that health must come first. So what then is needed to promote world health? In my view, there should be one or more broad international consortia that focus on global health. Such efforts must involve the active participation of governments, of foundations, of pharmaceutical companies, of hospitals, and most importantly, of very, very dedicated individuals, because it is individuals who really can make a difference in this world. There must be appropriate financial support, 
and there must be an appropriate infrastructure in each country to provide proper health care. In addition, there must be advances in medicine. There must be advances in methods for diagnosing, treating, and preventing disease. Many of today's diseases we don't know how to treat. Dengue fever, I have heard a lot about during my visit here so far. Other diseases we know how to treat, but the treatments aren't sufficiently good, or they are themselves toxic, or they are so expensive that they cannot be effectively used on a global scale. In addition, sometimes one has a treatment, but resistance to the treatment arises. Think about chloroquine-resistant malaria. And that means that new treatments must be developed, sometimes again and again. So where do novel advances in treatments come from? The answer, simply put, is basic biomedical science. In this lecture, I will demonstrate how basic research in biology can lead to discoveries that promise to provide new approaches to the treatment of disease. I also will advocate that governments and foundations allocate a significant portion of their research portfolios to basic research, even though it is often the need for very specific applications that face a given society and a given country. Today, I'm going to focus on one line of study from my own research laboratory. Um, part of the studies that led to my receiving the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 2002. Now, many people know that the Nobel Prize comes with a gold medal. And people also know that the Nobel Prize comes with some money. Many people, including myself, until relatively recently, don't know that the Nobel Prize also comes with a diploma. This is my Nobel diploma. And if you read it, you can see the words well enough and you can read Swedish. <laughs> At the end, what it says in part is that this prize was for understanding the genetic control of programmed cell death. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what these words mean. Genetics, cells, and programmed cell death. Genetics, as I'm sure most people in this audience know, is the study of genes. Genes are responsible for all of the biological processes that occur in living organisms. Genes are the basis of heredity. Each of us has inherited half of our genes from our mothers and the other half from our fathers. Genes can vary. Variations amongst us are responsible for many of the differences amongst those in the room today. Variations in genes can also cause or predispose us to disease. And there are a vast number of diseases that are caused by or influenced by our genes. Diseases as diverse as cancer, cardiovascular disorders, asthma, cystic fibrosis, premature aging, Alzheimer's disease, bone loss, and I could go on and on. Genes are crucially important to us and to our health. 
So the question then is, how can we learn about genes? How can we learn about what they do, and how can we learn about how they go wrong and cause disease? Now one approach to this is to study human genes, our genes, and many biomedical researchers do this, including myself. Some of my work is focused on human genes. But there's a difficulty in studying human genes because in many ways humans are not good experimental organisms. Um, we're difficult to manage, difficult to do experiments with, slow breeding time, relatively big, expensive to house, um, not ideal for many aspects of biological studies. Now fortunately, nature has provided us with an approach that gets around this problem. And that is because it turns out that genes are strikingly conserved among organisms. What this means is we can study genes in a very simple organism and figure out what they do, how they work, and then identify similar genes in people and determine do they do the same thing. Now that we have specific questions that we can ask about those particular genes. There are many experimental organisms that have been studied in some detail in modern biology to analyze genes. These organisms include mice, zebrafish, fruit flies, and single-cell yeasts that are made that are used for making beer or making bread. Another organism used in genetic studies is a microscopic worm, a roundworm, a nematode, a nematode called Cynorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans for short. And it is C. elegans that I have primarily studied. And I'll turn back to this organism in a few moments. So that's some words about genes. What about cells? What is a cell? The simplest way to think about a cell is that a cell is the fundamental unit of life. Our bodies are made up of cells, and we have many different kinds of cells. We have nerve cells, and muscle cells, and skin cells, and blood cells, and so on. So given that a cell is the unit of life, what is meant by programmed cell death? Programmed cell death is synonymous with naturally occurring cell death. In other words, cell death that occurs as a normal part, for example, of the biology of an organism. So let me explain in more detail how this can be. Think about development. A human being develops from a single cell, a fertilized egg cell. Sperm and egg get together makes a fertilized egg cell, that cell divides to make two, those two divide to make four, which divide to make eight, and so on, over and over again, until in us, we have generated something on the order of 10 million million cells, 10 to the 13th cells. Then each of these cells must take on specific characteristics, must differentiate, into nerve cells, muscle cells, blood cells, and so on. And these cells must form patterns and structures to make a nose or an ear or a brain a highly complicated structure. These processes, cell division, cell differentiation, and morphogenesis, are the fundamental basic processes of animal development and constitute fundamental problems in the field of developmental biology. In addition to these processes, there is another process that appears to be universal amongst animals 
and as important to animal development as the processes I've just described. That is the process of programmed cell death. Quite remarkably, I think, many of the cells that are generated in our bodies do not survive, but instead die. And it is these dying cells that we refer to as programmed cell deaths. Now, it's been known for many years that cell death can be a normal part of animal development. For example, consider a tadpole metamorphosing into a frog. The tadpole loses its tail. The tail is made up of cells. Those cells die as a normal part of the program of maturation of the tadpole, programmed cell death. As you heard in the introduction, humans in utero have webbing between their digits between fingers and between toes. This webbing is made of cells, and before a baby is born, the webbing disappears because those cells undergo programmed cell death. If you think about birds, and you focus particularly on their feet, they come in two flavors, webbed, these are birds that swim, and not webbed. The difference is a difference in the regulation of programmed cell death. In birds without webbed feet, the cells die, removing the webbing. In birds with webbed feet, those cells do not undergo programmed cell death. Now, if any of you have visited Boston, you may recognize some of these birds. The one in the upper right, the goose, lives along the Charles River, right near MIT, where I work. Photograph was taken by one of my postdoctoral researchers. And the pigeon in the lower left frequents the trucks that serve food at lunchtime. Again, taken by a member of my laboratory. Program cell death is seen widely amongst organisms. It can also be a major event. In the development of the human brain, in certain regions of the developing brain, as many as 85% of the nerve cells that are generated die by programmed cell death. In our blood, in cells of the immune system that circulate in our blood, as many as 95% of certain cell types that we generate, thymocytes, die by programmed cell death. So programmed cell death is really a very major phenomenon. But despite this fact, it was much ignored until relatively recently. Why was that the case? I think very simply that biologists, when they think about cells dying, used to think that what happens is if a cell is unhappy, it has been damaged, it hasn't been fed properly, something's wrong with it, then it dies. It just was difficult to think about cells dying because that was something that was normal. It was in part the discovery that view is wrong that led to my sharing the Nobel Prize. Because in short, what we found is that there is a biology of cell death every bit as much as there is a biology of other fundamental biological processes like cell division, cell differentiation, cell migration, and so on. And in particular, and I'll discuss this in a few moments, we identified genes that are necessary for cells to die by programmed cell death. If there are genes that control this process, the process must be an active biological process. 
not simply something that happens when cells are mistreated. So I've been talking now about programmed cell death as a normal aspect of biology. And if you think about human biology, any aspect of human biology, if it goes wrong, can lead to disease. And programmed cell death is no exception. And in fact, more and more diseases are coming to be associated with abnormalities in programmed cell death. There are two types of abnormalities. First, abnormalities in which there is too much cell death. Cells that should live instead die, resulting in a deficit of functional cells and particular clinical features. On the other hand, there are diseases in which there is too little cell death. Cells that should die instead survive, allowing extra cells to be present. And there are many disorders of the former sort and a number of disorders of the latter sort. For example, in neurodegenerative <coughs> disease, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron disease, nerve cells that should live instead die, leading to a marked deficit of nervous system function. Some of these diseases are thought to be, in part at least, conferred by activating at the wrong time and in the wrong cells programmed cell death. Some neurodegenerative diseases, like certain retinal degenerations that lead to blindness, are known to be essentially misplaced programmed cell death. Other disorders involve too much programmed cell death. Stroke, traumatic brain injury, which means in many countries, including here, falling off your motorcycle onto your head, um, cells die. And they die not only because they've been squashed and damaged, but in fact an increasing number of cells die because programmed cell death is activated near the cells that have been physically and directly damaged. Aspects of AIDS involve cells dying by programmed cell death that otherwise should survive. Heart attacks, heart failure, a variety of liver disorders, including uh, uh, cells that die in, in livers that have been infected with hepatitis C virus, and other disorders have too much programmed cell death. Conversely, there is too little cell death in, order, in disorders like autoimmune disease. I referred a few moments ago to all of these cells in our immune systems that die as we sit here today that are dying by programmed cell death. The reason they're dying is if those cells survive, what they are basically generated to do is to recognize and destroy foreign invading cells. And the ones that die are cells that are capable of recognizing self, our own bodies. If they don't die, those cells attack our bodies from within. And this is what autoimmune disease is. Cancer also involves too little cell death. If you think about cancer as one normally, or at least most people think about it, you think about cells dividing and dividing, generating too many cells, a cell proliferation. But the number of cells in the tissues in our bodies is defined by an equilibrium between two opposing processes. Cell division is adding cells, and cell death, programmed cell death, is taking cells away. The number of cells can be too high either because there's too much cell division or because there is too little cell death. And it turns out that certain cancers, such as follicular lymphoma, are fundamentally cancers of too little cell death. Furthermore, most and probably all cancers involve too little cell death. Cells that should be dying do not, allowing cell number 
to increase. In addition, the major ways we have of treating cancer, radiation, chemotherapy, the way they work is they activate this endogenous process of programmed cell death. So they're just, they're not simply damaging cells, but they're activating this biological process causing cells to die by uh, activating this process. So programmed cell death is very fundamental, both in the etiology and the treatment of human cancer. So given this variety of diseases that are associated with programmed cell death, it becomes important to understand the mechanisms, the genes, the proteins that are involved in this process. And it was our contributions to this understanding that was recognized by the Nobel Prize. Now what did we do? First, we did not study human beings or human disease. Instead, we studied this tiny, microscopic, roundworm, C. elegans. This animal is one millimeter in length, about the size of a piece of lint. And it is very easy to study. Three of us shared the Nobel Prize. First, Sidney Brenner. Sidney, you may know, has had a very major impact on biomedical science around the world, and in particular on biomedical science in Singapore. Sidney introduced C. elegans to modern biology, and he worked out basic methods for its study. Whereas we have 10 million million cells, C. elegans has 959. Whereas we take 18 to 20 years to become adults, maybe some of us longer, C. elegans takes three days. We can study 10 generations in a month. A variety of the biological features of C. elegans make it very attractive for analytic biological studies. The second person with whom I shared the prize was John Sulston. John, Sidney, and I worked together for some years in Cambridge, England at the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology. John studied the developmental biology of C. elegans, and in particular, he studied the pattern of cell divisions from the time of that first cell, the fertilized egg, to the time of adulthood. And because C. elegans has so few cells, only 959, and because development is so rapid, only three days, and because the animal is only a millimeter long and it's transparent, John could observe the pattern of cell divisions and draw out a pattern describing every cell division that occurs during the development of the animal. The complete cell lineage of an animal, the only complete cell lineage in biology that is known. So again, one cell, the fertilized egg divides to make two, two make four, and so on and so forth, and then it gets a bit more complicated as depicted here. This diagram shows the developmental origin of every cell in the animal, all 959. What John discovered was that the animal makes more than 959 cells. In fact, it makes precisely 131 extra cells. But these cells are not found in the adult. And the reason they're not found in the adult is that they die. They undergo programmed cell death. What I did with my laboratory at MIT was to study this process of programmed cell death, and in particular to identify the genes that are involved. 
We did this by seeking mutants, variants, genetic variants, in which the normal pattern of cell deaths did not occur. For example, if you look at these two <coughs> micrographs, um, you can sort of see on the top these very visible flat circles where the arrows point. Those are cells in the process of programmed cell death. And in the bottom, you see a mutant defective in a gene called SED3, in which no cell deaths can be seen. This is a mutant that fails in cell death. Our study showed that what happens to the SED3 gene in, these mut in this mutant is that it is inactivated. So you turn off SED3, and those cells that should die by programmed cell death instead survive. What then does SED3 do? If SED3 is active, cells undergo programmed cell death. In short, SED3 is a killer. SED3 is a gene <clears throat> that kills cells by programmed cell death, and its activity is essential for cells to die by programmed cell death. It was the discovery of SED3 that said that programmed cell death is an active biological process. Cells are dying because a gene is expressed and functions that makes those cells die. We then found a second gene that was a killer gene, a gene we named SED4. And we then analyzed SED3 and SED4 to ask the question, where in the animal do these genes act? Do they control some kind of humoral factors that circulate through the animal, making poisons that somehow specifically kill particular cells? Or do they act within those cells that die themselves? And the answer was the latter. SED3 and SED4 act within those cells that are going to die. And what this says is that programmed cell death, at least to this extent, programmed cell death is a process of cellular suicide. Cells are expressing genes that make those same cells die. We then identified a third gene. But it turned out this gene had an opposite function. This gene said 9 doesn't kill, but instead it's anti-death. It protects cells from dying, and in fact, it must be expressed in every cell of the body so that the cells that should live do so. And then we identified a fourth gene, a gene called EGL1 another killer gene. And we did a series of genetic and molecular experiments to ask three killers and a protector, how do they interact? And the answer was they act in a linear pathway. SED3 kills, SED4 kills by activating SED3, SED9 protects by preventing SED4 from activating SED3, and EGL1 kills by preventing SED9 from preventing SED4 from activating SED3. So this, then, is the basic genetic pathway for programmed cell death in C. elegans. by comparing these genes to genes that had been discovered, or in some cases, later discoveries made by others in the field, we could see that each of them has a human counterpart or a family of human counterparts. For example, SED9 is similar to a human cancer gene known as BCL2. BCL stands for B-cell lymphoma. And it is this gene, when it's aberrantly activated in B cells allows those B cells to survive and generate 
lymphoma, a particular form of cancer. BCL2, like said, 9 is a protector gene. Each of the other genes also has human counterparts, and it turned out that the pathway we had identified in C. elegans corresponds very closely to the pathway of similar genes that act within us to regulate programmed cell death. So that meant that our discovery said something about the biology of cell death in humans. And we can take this a step further, because again, remember this biology, when it goes wrong, causes disease. So now we can take the biology and say we can use these genes and their products as potential therapeutic targets. For example, the killer gene SED3 was a founding member of a family of protein cleaving enzymes, proteases, known as caspases. Caspases kill. So if you could inhibit caspase, you could prevent programmed cell death, and in fact, by doing so, you would have a molecule that was a candidate for treating diseases in which there is too much programmed cell death. Diseases like neurodegenerative disorders, heart attacks, heart failure, liver disease, and so on. Conversely, if you could inhibit a protective gene, you could activate programmed cell death in those cells in which programmed cell death had been inappropriately inactivated. For example, in cancer. You could cause those cells that are surviving to lead to too many cells to instead die by programmed cell death. So this pathway defined potential therapeutic targets, and there are now a fair number of biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies that are using these targets to attempt to intervene in this very broad spectrum of human diseases by either preventing or activating programmed cell death. Now, at this point, I'd like to put the discoveries that I've discussed into a somewhat broader context. The work that I described involved absolutely basic research. When we began, neither the generality nor the application of our efforts was at all clear. C. elegans was an obscure organism, even to biologists. Hardly anybody had ever studied this organism before. Genetic studies are highly abstract. I didn't target any disease, and I in fact didn't know if anything we found would be relevant to any organism other than C. elegans. I simply wanted to pursue a basic problem in biology, programmed cell death, using an organism in which I knew I could do high resolution, relatively rapid experiments. So despite this being fundamentally a problem of basic research, we have established mechanisms that appear to be universal among animals, and our findings, I think, may well prove to help treat a broad variety of human diseases. And I think there's some basic messages here. First of all, basic research, discovery-oriented research, will, in my view, very often lead not only to intellectually stimulating findings, and that's important in and of itself, but also to findings that are of practical import. Basic research is the driver of knowledge, of scientific knowledge, and basic research in biomedicine is the driver of biomedical knowledge. Now, how should basic research be supported? The first statement is it cannot be supported by the private sector. A company cannot develop a business plan if it doesn't know where an effort is going to go. I didn't know what would be found from these studies. I couldn't say we were going to cure cancer or anything else. 
Um, nonetheless, I could be confident that the new knowledge would in some way impact humanity. That's what governments are for, to support programs that are important, but in ways that cannot be defined so that they can be supported by the private sector. So it must be governments and foundations that support basic research. Furthermore, I believe that even countries with relatively small research budgets should provide significant support for pure basic research. And the reason is that such research can be crucial in ensuring that other research that goes on is of the highest quality, that it's rigorous, that it's up to date, that it takes advantage of new discoveries, and that it is creative as well. One needs some basic research, and the pharmaceutical companies have recognized this, and they have very strong basic research, the best of the companies, even when they know that the basic research that's going on is unlikely to be directly relevant to what they want to do in the business, they know they need those basic researchers to be able to evaluate and promote those programs that are crucial to their business. There's another aspect of the relationship between science and government that is crucial in a broader sense to promoting the best government policies. And that is, government policies, I believe, must be informed by good science. Policies all too often involve decisions in which scientific data are ignored, or sometimes distorted, or sometimes even fabricated for a political agenda. I think this is wrong. Public policies should be based upon the soundest science that is available. And only in this way can the best decisions be made for a country and for the world. Unfortunately, many countries have at times ignored this principle, even my own country, the United States. Last week, a week ago Monday, I had the enormous privilege and honor to be present in Washington, D.C. at the White House with President Obama. At this event, the President signed an executive order that did two things. First of all, he rescinded a political agenda-based rule that prohibited aspects of stem cell research in the United States. Secondly, and more fundamentally, he directed the staff of the White House to develop a strategy to restore scientific integrity to government decision making so that government decisions that are made by the U.S. federal government will be based going forward on the soundest of science. I think this order is an enormously important step for the U.S. and for the world, and I hope that other world governments will take note and, like the U.S., use scientific knowledge in making policy decisions, policy decisions involving really countless areas of interest, obvious ones, energy, security, health all should be based upon strong science. And if this is done, we will collectively be able to make the best decisions. And the best decisions should lead us into a world with the best prospects for world prosperity, world health, and I would argue world peace. So with that, I would like to end basically with two thank yous. First, to the many members of and visitors to my lab since I started my lab some 31 years ago. 
and second of all, to you for joining me here today. Thank you very much. So your talk was really thought-provoking. Thank you for that. Um, basically, the cell death is uh, inbuilt within animate or inanimate, whether, whether it is uh, animals or human being. Cell death is an inbuilt process within the body. My question is, how do you monitor and control it? Thank you and control cell death. Um, there are many ways of monitoring it that have been driven by the studies of this process over the years. So for example, in C. elegans, uh, our initial way of monitoring it was simply looking through a microscope and observing that a cell that was generated later disappeared. It went away. We then studied it through a more high-powered microscope, an electron microscope, and could describe details of the process uh, seen at a higher, higher resolution. As time has gone forward, many molecular markers of cells that are undergoing programmed cell death have been identified. And so one could use probes for these molecules and know that if a cell is expressing these molecules, it is essentially in the process of cell death. Which method is used to study cell death depends upon which cell deaths one wants to study. How do we perturb the process of cell death? Well, in an organism like C. elegans, we can do it by mutating genes. Uh, eliminating the activity of a killer gene allows cells that should die to live. Eliminating the activity of a protector gene allows cells that should uh, that should die. Um, what did I say the first time? Um, you, if you knock out a killer, a cell that should die will live. If you knock out a protector, a cell that should live would die. Um, one can also do this with small molecules. For example, an inhibitor of a caspase can be used in a mammalian cell or a human patient and stop cells from dying. So there are a variety of ways of perturbing this process. The hope that I expressed is that some of the methods that are being developed to perturb this process will lead to drugs that are useful. And in fact, there are a number of drugs in the clinic right now, um, one for liver disease, in which cell death is being blocked, and another for cancer, in which cell death is being promoted, that look quite promising, but they're not yet on the market, so they're not being sold for patients, but they have been in people and they look like they're working so far. from School of Medical Sciences. Um, I'm interested in your finding about the, ge uh, the genes EGA1, SET9, uh, SET4, and SET3. Um, I just wonder, because SET3 and SET4, you mentioned that uh, you found it uh, from gene knockout, if I understood correctly. And what about SET9, SET9 and EGA1? Is it the same? I mean... Well, those are the same. So that if you eliminate EGL1 activity, there's no death, just like eliminating SED3 or SED4. If you eliminate SED9, what happens is essentially the animal self-destructs because all of its cells try to undergo programmed cell death. You can have mutations in these genes that do other things. So that, for example, there is a mutation in SED9 that ab abnormally activates SED9. So you get too much protective activity, and then cells that should die instead live. 
very analogous to the human BCL2 gene, which can be activated in B cells and lead to cancer. Uh, the second question, I just wonder, I mean, how did you study the interaction between EGL1, set 9, set 3, and set 4? I mean, um, the, the study of interaction, because there's a lot of method, whether it's biophysical or... We used molecular genetic methods and we used biochemical methods. So we could show that in certain cases, if you made double mutants between two genes uh, that had opposite effects, killer and protector, which gene would win in the double mutant helps in ordering those genes. Um, we could show that if you use molecular genetic methods and overexpressed the gene that was responsible for one of these steps, how it would interface in the pathway. And we also characterized the proteins and showed which proteins interact with which other proteins. So we did a whole variety of different things, and the picture that emerged from all of these studies was consistent in the one that I showed in the, in the pathway slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk, uh, Professor Horvitz. My name is Chang Chi, by U.S. Congress, which uh, transferred the uh, ownership of intellectual property and patents from uh, research which was funded by, arising out of research funded by federal sources, and transferred the intellectual property and patents to the research institutions and all the researchers. Okay? I, in uh, recent years, okay, uh, there's been a trend within some uh, developing countries, including uh, South Africa, Brazil, India, China, and indeed Malaysia as well, yeah, to introduce uh, legislation model after the Baidu Act of 1980. I was wondering if you could share with us again some of your observations again of the impact of the Baidu Act in the United States research institutions and universities, including the uh, pattern of research carried out. Thanks. Okay, so the rationale behind the Baidu Act was to facilitate the transfer of information to allow basically a commercialization and the rapid translation of discoveries into products. And that was the goal. And the federal government felt that by disclaiming ownership, it would encourage institutions such as universities to really promote what would be innovation in science and technology in the society as, whole, as a whole. Um, that basic rationale, I believe, is very good, and I think it has worked very well with some exceptions. When that act was passed, there were many aspects of modern biology that were not appreciated. For example, that act predated much of modern molecular genetics. And what happened as a consequence was that there were things that were subject to buy dole and patented, and whether it was federal government or institution, didn't matter. Things that were patented, patented as inventions that I think many of us felt really were discoveries about nature rather than inventions per se. And the most striking area was the patenting of genes. A gene is something natural in a living organism. It takes experiments to figure out what a gene looks like. But the gene isn't really an invention. And a consequence of patenting genes was not in promoting commercialization, innovation, new, and, and new technological advances, but rather in slowing it down. The fundamental question with a patent is, does it really lead to something that's going to improve society for example, by allowing a company to invest an enormous amount of money to make an advance, pharmaceutical companies often do things like that, or is it gonna slow down progress because knowledge is being blocked and other individuals and groups won't be able to use the knowledge to make new discoveries. So I think by dole in general is a good principle 
but I think that, that countries ought to be very aware of the places where it's run into problems in the U.S. because it has not been a perfect solution. Yes, any more questions? Okay, if there is uh, no more question, I would like to call Madam Chairman, Dr. Rashid Rashida, to take over. Thank you, Professor Abu Hassan, for chairing the session, and Professor Hovitz for the informative and constructive lecture and discussion. Please remain on the stage. We now would like to invite Professor Ahmad Shukri to come on the stage to present a token of appreciation to Professor Hovitz. We also invite Mr. Uwe Morawitz to receive a souvenir from the Deputy Vice Chancellor. gentlemen, before we adjourn, we would like to thank all of you for joining us in this excellent Nobel Laureate Lecture. All of you are invited for light refreshment outside the hall. With that, thank you and assalamualaikum.